D David, you give me chills. I mean, you literally give me chills. It, it's so eloquent. And now we understand why you fill up Wembley Stadium, why you fill up when you're allowed to travel and be in yeah. other countries, why you speak to thousands and thousands of people, unprecedented, uh, really, for, for someone of in the lane that you're riding in to do that. But I want to return to a question I asked kind of at the beginning, because I think it's also something that people struggle with, people who are spiritually minded struggle with. And that is the action versus being part. Like, I need to just be my spiritual self and evolve my spiritual self versus I need to take action. And sometimes that action might be in conflict ultimately with someone else, even if I don't seek that out. How do you balance that action versus being, the doing versus being part that you, you get what I'm saying in terms of those are common terms, are common questions inside spiritual communities. But your being becomes your doing. Your doing is an expression of your being. And I do find, Alex, and you know, I, I've been on this journey a long time and, and, and I've seen a lot of things and met a lot of people. Um, it, it, the height of what was called the New Age movement, I saw, um, I met some lovely people, but I saw an enormous amount of denial and escapism masquerading as spirituality, whereby um, I'm just working on my being that being an excuse not to express a doing because you'd rather not face the consequences of doing it and so they used to say about because when i when i started going around america uh, the, in the early 1990s or mid 1990s um i was invited to speak here and there at those um, big whole life expos they used to have there's one out of Los Angeles, one out of San Francisco. And I would be the strange conspiracy guy um, at uh, 10 o'clock at night when everyone had gone home. Um, and they used to say, but what you're saying is negative. And, well, two things to that. Uh, uh, well, they also used to say, um, you, 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 you're getting people to go, go, go into fear. Well, two things well a number of things never mind two one if you are if you are <clears throat> spiritually kind of open as you say you are so what wh why are you talking about fear you know fear should not be affecting you if you're if you if you're really connected and this is the other point um i used to hear them say people have to wake up yes but in that case, wouldn't it be a good idea to address what is keeping them asleep? Because if you, if you read my books, Alex, I never cover in a book the names, dates, places, nature of the conspiracy without doing the, 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 uh, going to the spiritual nature of reality. Because the two are not um, apart from each other. They are expressions of each other. Uh, and, you know, I don't think myself that we come into this reality as it is to then try to convince ourselves that we haven't. Um, and therefore, we, we, we don't have to go into areas that we'd rather not go into. True spirituality, the great spiritual people of history were not necessarily and overwhelmingly were not those who went to church. They weren't those who, who um, ran some, some coven or cult. They were the ones that actually said, this is not right, and I am going to do what I can to make a difference about it. And they didn't call themselves spiritual. They didn't call themselves religious. They just did what they knew to be right, and they're the people that change things because they face head on what needs changing rather than trying to find an excuse not to go there. I'll give you an example, just a quick one. Uh, there, there's someone in, in Britain who uh, kind of 
claims to be part of the alternative media. Um, but when the masks came in um, for mandatory masks in shops, they said that they had made a decision that they were going to wear a mask in shops uh, because they said they, they didn't want old people to feel unsafe, right? So you're listening to that and you're saying, no, nah. <clears throat> let me just um, translate that. You want an excuse not to um, disobey authority. That's what you, you want. And so you've, you've come up with that. Uh, and, and this is what I mean about finding an excuse not to do what you know to be right. And for me, once you do this, everything changes. Everything, everything changes. Not least because um, as this takes you out there uh, to levels of perception, level of insight, levels of awareness that are not within this bubble, but are well beyond the bubble, you can um, observe this reality from outside this reality. And so instead of within the bubble, everything's random dots, what's going on, you see the picture when you go into this expanded state of awareness. And, you know, I'm not sitting on a mountain like the Buddha saying, look, you know, I've found enlightenment. Um, this is this is our natural state. It's how is, it, is it okay for the Buddha to sit on the mountain? Is it okay for that yogi to sit in the caves in the Himalayas? Is he maybe doing his right action? Because I love what you're saying. I totally, you're so totally congruent in what you're saying. Can people express that differently? Or, or is non-action always but, an excuse? But of, but of, but of course they can. Um, I mean, uh, you, you can, well, um, but, but then again, you know, when you take the story of, of the Buddha, it, it wasn't about non-action. Sharing um, knowledge is not non-action. It doesn't. Uh, action doesn't have to mean that you you, gra you grab a um, a um, a poster and and go out on the street. In fact, I think that's that's a, a waste of, of 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 effort in so many ways, because um, you know I see um, people. Uh, mistaking in my view i can only come from from where i'm coming from other people have a different view and they're, they're, they're entitled to it they're right to it but i see people um going out on protests i, I i'll give you an example we had a protest uh in britain um against the up against the government against the establishment right it was an basically an anti-establishment protest and everyone was wearing a mask or vast numbers were wearing a mask so you're going on a protest against the establishment, yeah, and you're wearing a mask. Why? Well, well, because they told us we have to. Uh, yeah, okay. So how does that work out? You know, um, and you go out and you protest. Okay, you've protested and, you know, it makes you feel good. Okay, that's no problem with that. But then what? Um, or you're gonna, we're going to fight the enemy. Oh, yeah. We're going to fight the enemy. We're going to stockpile weapons. We're going to fight them. Um, and yet none of that is necessary. All that is necessary is I'm going to do what I know to be right. And different people will come to different conclusions, but you're doing what you know to be right. Uh, and therefore you're not just in that perceptual state, you are going to express it. It's not just a being, it's a doing. Uh, and Therefore, um, you are um, you are making a massive uh, statement, and collectively, you are making a a transformation of society with a simple one syllable word. No, David. No, uh, no he's David, negative. No, couple... he's not negative. No can be an incredibly powerfully positive word you are going to do this because we the few have said you will do it no won't do it no no panna no protest no stockpiling weapons no not doing it um and and when ever thousands of people have refused to acquiesce re refused to obey um the all-powerful state 
doesn't know what to do with them because the, the, the state power and cult power behind the state depend on human acquiescence. It, 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 um, it depends on people saying, yes, sir, when they really would rather say no, but what are the consequences for me? The heart would never do that. Uh, that's incredible. Two, maybe three more questions if I can squeeze it in. Sure. One, could you speak to religion? Because many people get offended. They feel like religious beliefs are somehow protected beliefs. And to many other folks, it just looks like a complete another aspect of this social engineering project. It's a way of getting between us and our connection to that ultimate extended consciousness. It takes many forms. It has many of the aspects of control that you've talked about. Speak to religious beliefs and whatever you have to say about that. Well, I'm, I'm, I call it in general the God program. And we have all these religions, Alex, but when you break it down, when you break the God program down, it, it operates the same. It's a blueprint. And all the different names and different rituals, they kind of obscure the fact that actually it is a very simple blueprint. And you've mentioned part of it there in that, you know, I talk about this Wetiko virus, uh, mind virus, wants to get in there in the spaces or make spaces between the five sense mind and uh, expanded awareness. Well, look at the blueprint of religion. Okay. So what are you? I'm a Christian. What does that mean? Well, I go to church and this man in a frock, women uh, uh, often now, uh, tells me what God wants me to do. Okay. Well, that's interesting. And uh, he tells me the consequences of me not doing what God wants me to do. Okay. Uh, uh, you? Oh, I'm a Muslim. Uh, what does that mean? Well, I go to the mosque and this man um, in, 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 in a frock, he tells me what God uh, uh, wants me to do and what God will do if I don't do what God says, which is what this man in a frock tells me he says. Okay. You? Oh, I, I, I follow Judaism. What does that mean? Oh, I go to the synagogue. And this man in a frock, he tells me what God wants me to do and that there'll be hell and damnation if I don't do what he says. Uh, and, um, and and that's, that, 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 that's what Judaism is. And so you go on and you go on and you go on. Um, and what are those people in frocks actually doing, Alex? They're getting in the spaces between the five sense mind and expanded consciousness they do not want a direct connection and, and even the word connection is not correct and it's only a human language because it's not even a connection because what is all one does not connect it just is um, and uh, th what what happens is that we get a disconnection of influence doesn't mean we're not still part of the, the great forever. We always are and always will be. It's that it's not influencing us because of this perceptual isolation, which religion has played a major, major part in. So what you had originally was uh, a, a, a forms of culture that for all their flaws, and there were many, um, they practiced a direct connection with what they perceived as the creator or um, what I call the one. And then religion came in and it um, created that blueprint and we got the only through this can you get to God. Only through me, only through me, um, only through believing me and what I say um, can, you, can you get there. And by the way, um, we're going to give you a, a story. We're going to give you a series of rules and regulations. And if you don't follow them, well, you, well, you ever stoke the fires of hell? Well, that's where you're going, mate. <laughs> um, and then uh, as the impact of that, um, what was that? It was a, 
was a tiny, tiny um, perceptual state that's being sold here. You can't question it because you're black. You're a blasphemer if you do, and you're out. You're not one of us anymore. But as people started to reject that, then in came mainstream science, and we went from a situation where you can only get to the state of expanded consciousness, as I would call it, if you do what we tell you, because we know what God wants. We went to actually. There is no state of expanded consciousness. There's just you and you come out of nowhere, three score years and 10 if you're lucky, and then you go back into nowhere. So, and, and now basically you've got these two working uh, simultaneously with the, the science through technology and the technocracy that's developing, controlled by technocrats, not politicians. Um, is is now becoming more and more and more and more dominant. Uh, and there's a common theme. I mean, just look at the common themes everywhere that this system, this cult behind the system is um, emphasizing everywhere. And that is you, you cannot have a direct connection with expanded states of consciousness. You so did have that direct connection. And I wonder if you could... Tell us how that informed this whole process. Because a lot of people go back, they'll look, they'll read in your books, and maybe you want to mention the books that actually detail you being on the mountain and having that experience, direct experience, personal experience, and then interacting with nature in a strange way that we hear so often, you know, the cloud comes over. I can't only tell you how many times I've heard that from other people who've had these shamanic journeys, but you experienced this extended realm. It even changed you in this transformational way where a lot of people struggle reintegrating that and you did for a few months, but then you just explode in terms of your knowledge and what you've been able to bring forth with that. But I also want you to expl explain, if you can, what you learned about the other realms of that extended realm, the, 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 in particular, maybe some of the darker aspects of it. Can you tie that into it, your direct experience, and where we can learn more about that? Well, I mean, what, what, what happened to me is, um, just very quickly, uh, I was a television presenter with the BBC and a national spokesman for the British Green Party at the time in the 1980s. Um, I had this strange experience uh, over a year where when I was in a room alone, it seemed like there was someone else there that's got more and more tangible, more and more powerful. And eventually I um, spoke out into an empty hotel room. If you're there, would you please contact me because you'll drive me up the wall. And a few days later, not many days, um, I was in a bookstore just down the road from here, still there, not a bookstore so much as a, a news shop, news agent. Uh, and um, I had this experience um, where suddenly my feet uh, were stuck to the ground. Um, I was standing at the entrance uh, like magnets were pulling them down to the ground. And I had this. It wasn't a voice. It was a thought form, a strong thought form. It said, go and look at the books on the far side. Now, I'm new to all this at the time. This is 30 years ago. Uh, and I'm bewildered of what's going on. And, and I start walking towards the very few books in this shop because it sold tourist things, buckets and spades, newspapers and stuff, very few books. And they were romantic novels overwhelmingly. I knew the shop well. I thought, what, what the hell am I going over here for? But it, something was leading me there. And I got there and there was one book in among the romantic novels and it was a book called Mind to Mind by Betty Shine, who was a professional psychic. I'd never been to a psychic before. But I, I just had a year with this presence around me, and which was getting more and more powerful. So I read her book. I went to see her, not telling her anything, except that, you know, maybe her hands-on healing might help because I had arthritis. And um, in the three times, three times, four times I went over a period of a month, um, she went into psychic mode and said I was going to go out on a world stage and reveal great secrets. And basically... Um, she described what has happened in the last 30 years um, in, um, in, in a few minutes. Uh, and then um, I, in a bewildered state, because my life was dramatically changing, my awareness, my perceptions were dramatically changing through uh, 1990. 
and into early 1991. And suddenly I, um, I had this overwhelming feeling to go to Peru. And uh, I got on a plane to Peru purely, purely on, I, I know, I know I need to go there. You know, this, this intuitive knowing that we have when we open our heart. Uh, and so I went there and lots of amazing things happened. Uh, but I ended up on a, on a, on a hill at a place called Siustani, uh, not far from Puno in uh, near Lake Titicaca. And um, I, 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 was, I was in a, I was in a kind of a taxi bus, which I'd hired to take me there. It was out of season. Uh, and as we were driving away, um, I looked at this hill and uh, all I could hear in my head was, come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me. Uh, and, you know, people will appreciate when this is all new to you, you know, you wonder what the hell's happening to you. So anyway, I said, stop the bus, please, because I'm going up that hill. And I went up the hill. And um, as I was standing there we, uh, under a piercing hot Peruvian sun with no clouds, what um, came through my, through my head was, um, they'll be talking about this 100 years from now, um, it will be over when you feel the rain, which was a, a ridiculous thing under a, a piercing hot, cloudless Peruvian sky. But anyway, this energy started to go into the top of my head and through my feet and then come the other way. And then my arms went out at 45 degrees without any conscious decision to do it. And the energy uh, was building up and building up. My body started to shake. And, um, and I was going in and out of consciousness, like when you're driving a car and you forget where the last two miles has gone, your subconscious has been driving the car, thank goodness. And it was a bit like that. And one of these times I came back to, to, to a, a conscious state, I saw that there was um, a light gray mist over the distant mountains. And as I watched it, it happened ever so quick, ridiculously quick, like a, like a, 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 a video um, on, on fast forward. Uh, and um, it got darker and darker, and I thought, it's raining over those mountains. And in the next uh, little while, I watched this, uh, well, it was just stair rod rain coming towards me. And, and as it got towards me, it was straight out of some B movie that no one would ever believe. It was a wall of rain coming towards me. And um, eventually it hit me and I was soaked in a second. And by this time, my body is shaking uh, crazy with this energy. And as um, and soon as the, the, the rain hit me, the, the energy went, stopped. And now my arms, which didn't hurt before, agony. My legs were like jelly. And um, my life changed then. Um, I, I, I came back to England, um, concepts and things, uh, insights were pouring into my conscious mind, far, far too many to process. And um, it was like pressing too many keys on the computer, the computer froze, couldn't process it. Uh, and I went through three months of um, almost not knowing my name, not quite that, but, but you get the point. I didn't know where I was, what I was doing, what was happening to me. And then um, it was like the computer unfroze after about three months. And it happened very quickly. The, the, the unfreezing happened very quickly. And suddenly I am who I was before, but not. People who, um, who I met were saying, well, I, th I thought you're supposed to have gone crazy there. Because it was in all the media, I'd gone mad because I was a television presenter at the time or uh, in that period, um, they said, um, they said, you've gone mad, you're, you're, the, you're the Dave I've always known. And I kind of was outwardly, like I am now. But uh, I saw the world completely differently. Instead of, instead of seeing the dots, I saw, I saw how they connected. Um, I, I, I would see what was really being said as opposed to what the words said. And what I what happened was um, my life became this synchronistic journey of meeting people, running into um, experiences, coming across documents and books and stuff. And it was it was like some force was handing me puzzle pieces in the to put into the the picture. 
And, uh, you know, I've got a, a stream of books here. Uh, a lot of them are very considerable because they cover so many interconnected subjects. And I would never have been able to produce those books if um, I was um, just using my conscious mind and there wasn't some other force that was, it was like walking through a maze, Alex, and someone was opening and shutting the doors. Uh, uh, so you went in the right direction. Without that, and that was coming from some other level, uh, then you, 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 you couldn't be done because what, what is what is being uncovered and what i uncover in the answer um does not want to be uncovered and without support from other levels of uh, consciousness reality whatever you want to call them you couldn't possibly have unraveled it um and it is you know i mean it's taken 30 years as it, as it is but without that um without that uh, that that support that um guidance uh you couldn't be done david final question the new book, The Answer, that is out just now, it's just coming out today or tomorrow, I think, as, as we speak here. What does it have to say about a topic you've covered uh, more thoroughly and before anyone really was on it? Again, I mean, it's like a repeating story about our connection to the U UFO ET phenomenon, and in particular, I wanted to hone in on a couple of points. You know, in the last couple of years here in the United States, the Department of Defense has taken hold of that narrative, has co-opted, have spun it into this political, in my opinion, what is a political psyop disclosure. And it has very much of a, this is a national defense issue. So we have that on one hand. It's almost like a parallel of what you're talking about, how we have science and religion each, each sandwiching us in to disrupt our understanding of consciousness. Here we have the good ET, bad ET, and we have both narratives existing at the same time where the DOD is continuing to spin the uh, ET is going to, it's a national defense issue, so give us all the power to go and deal with it. And then at the same time, we have folks in the UF. O community, the ET experiencer community, are saying, no, these are actually bringers of spiritual transformation, and it's a good ET, and they're trying to protect our environment. And so in the process of, if you can, covering all that, I also want you to touch on the fact that we are almost certainly looking at many, many species with many, many agendas, with many from different places. So, you know, we can't automatically just say ET either, can we? So I know I laid a lot on the table there, but oh, well, if anyone where, can handle it, you can. Where, where do you start? Well, I, I come from that angle um, from uh, a different point of view. Um, uh, just after the turn of the millennium, uh, I I'd thought about it before, but just after the turn of the millennium, I concluded that we live in some kind of virtual reality. Um, well, M Matrix, uh, to use the na uh, name in the movies, but a, a virtual reality, um, which was part of the disconnecting of uh, our perception of reality from uh, the greater reality. And um, when, um, when, I, when I was a kid, in, 19, in the 1950s, uh, my father had no interest in astronomy before this incident or afterwards. And I'm still bewildered about what the heck happened. Um, we had no money. We never went anywhere because we had no money. And one day, it would have been about 1958-59, uh, my father walked down the stairs one morning um, and said, we're going to London. And uh, I was shocked because I'd never been to London. It was a long time before I'd go again. And what, 1958, 59, I would be six or seven. We're going to London. And I remember we went on a steam train. Um, and my father said, we're going to the planetarium. Now, I didn't know what a planetarium was. I wasn't bothered. I just, want, I, I just wanted to go to London. I'd heard about it or so much about it. So we got on this steam train to London. We go to a planetarium, which 
I, I know the date because it had just opened. It opened in 1958 in London, next to Madame Tussauds in London, in Baker Street. And um, so I didn't know what to expect. So we walk into this planetarium and I, I sit down at the seat. I don't know what to expect. And then suddenly uh, the roof, the ceiling, dome ceiling, became the night sky. And it must have been about midday that we were sitting there. And I looked at it and something hit me that never left me. That even at that early age, that could be the night sky. It looked like that it was midnight and the roof had come off. And that never left me. And um, when all this started for me that I've just described, um, I, I looked up, up at the sky one day and, and it appeared to me as a gigantic dome, like something out of the Truman Show, you know. Uh, and that all came back to me when I started to um, go down this road of uh, this is some kind of holographic projection. And this comes into your question because... Of course, we know about this whole concept of the, was it the Fermi paradox of how there can be so many planets and so many stars, and yet the amount of conscious ET activity is ridiculously little compared with that potential out there. And for me, um, the the lack of et activity on the against the potential of it is part of isolating human perception you imagine if there was um there were uh other races what we call ets um interacting with the earth imagine what would happen to human perception it would be dramatically different we would be getting access to tremendously different perceptions of reality, perceptions of possibility, how to look at life, how to look at this, and how to look at everything. We would be in a, a completely different knowledge base. But if you can isolate or perceptually isolate people to the point where there is no out there, or perceived to be no out there, certainly no conscious interaction then you can isolate this bubble again and you can control what you can control the information that the target population receives which leads to its perception which leads to its behavior and i'm not saying not for a second and, and i wouldn't because don't believe it's true that um uh, what we call ets can't come into this um projected reality both malevolent and um, but the other kind. But um, it's my feeling that this, this, this reality, uh, this astronomical reality, is not teeming with life as you would probably expect it to be. Because if it was, the ability to control would not be a tiny fraction of what it is be impossible in fact there be too many sources of other information and um i see this one planet this one green from a human physiological point of view inhabitable planet which according to mainstream science anyway compared with the projected size of the universe is about a billionth of a pinhead and then I see all this, all this uh, other potential for life, uh, planets, stars, etc., that appear to not, uh, certainly within, within the frequency band of human sight, not to be inhabited. And it makes no sense to me whatsoever that a planet so small should have this phenomenally beautiful environment 
very unique environment and then you look out and there's nothing else certainly within interaction range that's anything like it so you've got humanity many people within humanity do actually believe that there is nothing out there and it's an, another part of this isolation and um, I, I wonder what it is that we're looking at when we look at the night sky. Because that experience when I was six or seven years old in the planetarium hit me so powerfully, I never forgot it. Basically, well, if I can see the night sky on the top of a ceiling, then what is the night sky? Um, and, and I'm still thinking like that now. Uh, and um, so I'm, like, like everything in all reality, there, there are uh, benevolent expressions of all that is. And there are, shall we say, Watiko infested expressions uh, of all that is. But I just wonder what this, what this night sky really is, what this space that we perceive really is and whether it is what we think it is or actually just a holographic perception which would uh, a projection rather which would um which to our senses would seem incredibly real as it does our guest again has been david ike truly as i said at the beginning one of the bravest i would say one of the most important thinkers of our time He's never going to make it on that Times list of one of the top 100 most influential. Thank God, Alex. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Be sure to check out this new book, The Answer. And hopefully it's an entry point, if you haven't, to checking out his other books. I think Trigger is super duper important book if you haven't looked at that. But his website is fantastic, too. I'm a member. Many, many videos, blog posts, valuable stuff, well, well worth it, iconic.com. And we have to support, even more, we have to support this kind of work because part of the process is to put this boa constrictor stranglehold and gradually try and cut off the money that this important research deserves. So David, truly, truly wonderful having you on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, we started Iconic, uh, which now is about 750 videos and um, uh, series and podcasts and full length feature films because we could see this. Uh, we could see this severe censorship coming and we wanted a, a place where this could be available. And uh, some great news. Uh, I think it's great news anyway. Um, uh, we've just uh, licensed um, Vax, you know, the movie Vax. Oh, yeah, uh, right. Yeah, uh, about vaccinations, which there a big controversy with De Niro's um, film premiere, if you remember. Uh, we, we, we've licensed that. So um, it, that, that's on um, uh, Iconic very soon. The only place you can see it streamed. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to offer, if anyone's stuck around this long, I'm going to purchase for you, for listeners, 10 copies of The Answer. Okay, and I'll assign those randomly for every 10th person that that gets to me. Okay, so the first 100 that email me every 10 one will, will receive a copy of the answer compliments of the show because it's so, so important. And I hope when you receive that, the one thing I'd ask is that you do check out Iconic and at least sign up for a month and see if it doesn't provide the kind of value that I'm talking about. Okay, so just email me. And I'll be honest about it. Every 10th one, I'll give you a copy of the answer with the hope that you'll check out Iconic. So, David, thanks again. Good luck yep. with the rollout of this and all the terrific work that you're doing. Real pleasure, Alex. Really lovely talking to you. Thanks again to David Icke for joining me today on Skeptico. I'm probably going to be diving further into this topic because I'm not so certain about some of the science he's referring to. But again, as I tried to make clear in the interview, the overall lay of the land that he's describing is so 
incredibly on target and way, way too close to the truth. I mean, scary close to the truth. So I guess that is the question to tee up from this interview. And that is, what do you take from David Icke's view of the COVID-19 pandemic? And what do you leave behind? Love to hear your thoughts. They will inform me. They will drive me. They will direct me in how I move with this. So please let me know what you're thinking. And thanks as usual so much for joining me and for being a part of this. I have some good ones coming up. I did slip David Ike in here ahead of some other ones. <laughs> I have some ones that are going to be really delayed, but that's okay. Uh, they'll all get out there and the book will get out there too and it'll all work out just the way it's supposed to. Until next time, take care and bye for now.